Well, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Dr. Jill Live. You can find all other episodes on YouTube, on Stitcher, on iTunes, or wherever you watch or listen to podcasts. Hopefully you're enjoying this, and I hope you do subscribe and leave some uh, reviews there for us. Today, I have a special guest who is no uh, secret to you all if you've been watching Dr. Jill Live. As I've heard some of the reviews, he's one of your favorites because we go deep and we go into the mechanistic pathways. And today is no different. Every single time I talk to Bob, we have some new groundbreaking information on these enzymatical pathways and how they affect our health, especially if you're listening and you've dealt with chronic Lyme disease or mold toxicity or uh, post-COVID or symptoms after Epstein-Barr virus. It's real common that often these genetic pathways are the secret to why you're suffering or why you can't figure it out. And you're going to learn something really exciting today about heme oxygenase. Uh, before I jump in, again, you probably know Bob, but I'll give a brief introduction. Uh, he's a traditional naturopath specializing in the field of genetic specific nutrition. He earned his traditional naturopathic degree at Trinity School of Natural Health and is board certified through the ANMA. He recently opened, actually not recently, about 20 years ago, opened Tree of Life practice and served as a traditional naturopath for 27 years. And then lately in the last several years, he's been engaging exclusively with functional nutritional genetics. And if you're a practitioner listening, which we have lots of practitioners, you have probably used his test or seen his test. I don't know of anyone who hasn't um, been familiar with some of these pathways. Bob, welcome, welcome. As always, it is absolutely a pleasure and an honor to have you here today. And I'm super excited about our path. Um, before we jump in, any just brief little um, teaser on, on what we might find today with the heme oxygenase or, or why it's important to the listener? Oh, sure. You know, the uh, we've been looking at some of our other podcasts on how we make inflammation. And we've looked at, you know, things like glutathione and superoxide dismutase and all those helpful things. And I was really surprised to learn that what we're going to talk about today is a major pathway that we use for detoxification and reducing inflammation. So as you so aptly said, if you've got mycotoxins or Lyme or some other uh, chronic inflammatory, this may be one of the pathways that uh, that might be disrupted and we need to work on. So uh, Hang on, put your seatbelt on because we're going to uh, we're going to go for a ride here today. Super excited! Take it away, Bob. <laughs> All right, All right. Well, we're going to do a, a slide screen share here with the uh, with the slides. And let's see. I think um, you got the slides there. I see screen. There we go. Looks good. Bob. Yeah. Okay. All right. Our topic is why the heme oxygenase enzyme is critical for your health. And of course, we're not uh, practicing medicine here. We're just giving you information. It's a uh, literature review. And people have seen this before. So I said heme oxygenase, another 3D chess game played underwater and the environmental and genetic factors that impact it. Now, I just uh, drew this little diagram from the literature that uh, we found. We're going to be talking today about an enzyme called heme oxygenase. And just in case anybody doesn't know, your DNA is instructions on how to make enzymes. And enzymes either make something or clear something or have some other function inside the body. And when they're mutated, they most of the time don't do the job as well, but sometimes they do their job too well. Neither one can cause a problem. So let's take a look up here. You see that the um, heme oxygenase can decrease the oxidative damage to the, to the pancreas. It helps kidney function. It actually can help reduce joint swelling and inflammation. It's actually involved with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease that can be associated with obesity and diabetes. Can help reduce gut inflammation and reduce the secretion of pro-inflammatory cytokines. Helps with the cardiovascular system and metabolic function. There's very few enzymes that have such a myriad of impacts upon the body. Now, I wanted to show this first because as you know, Dr. Jill, we are seeing such an increase in autism. I believe it used to be one out of a thousand, and I think the latest might be one out of 44 or 45 or something like that. Someone did a study of low heme oxygenase serum levels in children with autism. And the conclusion is, this study suggests that oxidative stress is higher in children with autism, and that heme oxygenase levels are insufficient to achieve oxidative balance. Uh, that one was quite surprising because when you talk to uh, elementary school teachers who've just taught five years, even aside from autism, we're just seeing so much ADD, ADHD, inability to concentrate. It's uh, 
becoming a very serious problem. And clearly, this isn't the only issue. It may be um, neuroinflammation from other factors, but the heme oxygenase may be playing a role in helping to reduce it. Now, you did an excellent article, and uh, I'm encouraging everybody to read this article to learn about the heme oxygenase benefits. It's on your uh, it's on your website. You called it heme oxygenase one can boosting and help in autoimmunity. And you very well described in one sentence what heme oxygenase is. It's an enzyme involved in a process known as heme group degradation. And we're going to talk about what a what a heme is. And it breaks down and dissembles it, uh, the type of molecule known as heme. It's an important uh, role in various biological processes. It's bound to be uh, bound, it's designed to be bound to other compounds and I'm going to show you what uh, what it does. And when it's not, it becomes a potent inducer of inflammation. However, your body has an anti all natural built in defense mechanism, and that's the uh, the heme oxygenase. So this might be a topic for another show. So I'm going to go through this one very briefly. But what happens is that glycine and succinyl COA go through eight steps called the heme cycle. The very last step, the fetch enzyme puts iron on the heme and you've got your heme. Look on the right here. Heme plays a role in hemoglobin, myoglobin, neuroglobin, mm -hmm. cytochrome P450. That's your phase one detox. Cytochrome C electron transport, peroxidase, catalase. These are um, catalase, a major antioxidant. NADPH, as you know, we did a, uh, yeah. a whole show on the importance of NADPH tryptophan for your uh, serotonin nitric oxide synthase and you know we did a uh, an entire show on uh, nitric oxide and the infamous carnahan reaction yes. and then the uh, the suox enzyme which is your sulfite to sulfates so it's pretty amazing what this is involved with and you can have genetic mutations anywhere along the pathway here or possibly glyphosate might be impacting glycine and if your mitochondria is not doing a very good job, uh, you may not have enough succinyl COA. So there's a lot of things here. And uh, in our genetic uh, health consulting, we are finding that many people who are struggling may have some genetic issues along the pathway or lead. Lead will impede this uh, as well. So this is a diagram that shows all of the enzymes. And these are your cytochrome, cytochrome P450s. Every one of these are dependent upon heme to function properly. So cytochrome P450 is many of your phase one detoxes that clears medications, is also involved with your steroid hormones and is involved in many, many processes. We're just beginning to learn the extent of the, uh, the CYPs. You'll also see at the bottom, your nitric oxide mm -hmm. is involved. Your SUOX is involved. So if we don't have enough heme, we can have no mutations on these whatsoever they're not going to work because it doesn't have what it needs to work. This makes so much sense, Bob, as far as why it's such a big deal, which is <laughs> exciting that we're talking about this. Absolutely. Now, again, I really encourage you to read this article. You go into the details. I just gave the, the key points here. Cytoprotective, antioxidant, immunosuppressive. And it's like, what? Why is that good? good thing? You explain that. Anti-inflammatory, support in autoimmune and inflammatory diseases and antimicrobial. So uh, go to your website and read the whole article. You really did a fantastic job on that, Dr. Jill. Thank you, Bob. And I just have to credit you because you were the one who got me thinking about it. And I thought I got to start writing about this. And I think it was based on some of the articles we shared. So believe me, it was really on your instigation. And I just love, I want to mention the immune thing because I think people are learning this and understanding if you're a practitioner, you're seeing this, but really at the crux of so much of the chronic complex, whether it's mold or Lyme or long COVID, it is either overactivated immune system or underactive. It's this dysfunction of the immune system. And we're going to dive into that and why the heme is so important to, to that. Absolutely. Very well said. So here's what we're going to do today. We're going to really move quickly. We're going to review the inflammation pathways discussed in platelet activation and Ranty's pathway. That was episode number 102. I would really encourage people to go back to that one because we go into detail. I'm going to do the cliff notes in about two minutes of what we carried covered in a, an hour and a half. Then the purpose and function of heme oxygenase. And this is going to surprise people. It makes small amounts of carbon monoxide, which may be protective. And people might be thinking, no, wait, isn't that what kills you? Yes, 
but a small amount of it that the body makes can actually be helpful. Converts your iron into ferritin. If we don't do that, we have a real problem. And the most thing we're going to talk about today is making the powerful antioxidant bilirubin. Now, a lot of people say, no, wait a minute, isn't that what people have uh, too much of sometimes, like Gilbert syndrome, or when babies are born, they're yellow and they need to go under a light? Yes, but interestingly, at the right amount, bilirubin is right up there with glutathione as an antioxidant. How it protects us, why NADPH, one of my favorite subjects, uh, is so important, and we're going to talk about a new enzyme, POR. Then we'll talk about the environmental and genetic issues, uh, the various SNPs, and then we're going to take a look at your heme oxygenase pathway, <laughs> sharing it with the world. You're, you're brave, Dr. I always love being the guinea pig, Bob. And thank goodness I have so many good genetic mutations. We give lots of, we'll have hours and hours of discussion. <laughs> <laughs> and then the bottom line, what can we do lifestyle-wise, diet-wise, or supplementation that might be beneficial? Now, this is a uh, somewhat revised map from what we had uh, before. And, uh, oops, I want to uh, make this uh, a little bit bigger. There we go. So this is what we covered in the uh, previous uh, podcast. And I'm going to go through this very, very quickly. There's an enzyme called uh, TNFA, tumor necrosis factor alpha. And this is our friend, unless it's not because this will be stimulated by any kind of lipopolysaccharides, mycotoxins, virus, clostridia, uh, any um, borrelia, all of those will stimulate. And that's okay, unless it's overactive. And you can have mutations on this that are gain of function. Iron, critical for life, but there are genetic mutations that you can absorb extra. And that will also stimulate TNFA. Then it stimulates another nasty uh, free radical producer called NF-kappa B. And maybe I shouldn't use that name because we need it in some instances to kill pathogens. Then it stimulates the NOx enzyme, NADPH oxidase. And we did a whole webinar on this, on how this is our friend because it makes mast cells to kill pathogens. But if upregulated, we have too many mast cells and we have mast cell activation. And we've spoken about this before that, you know, 20 years ago, we barely saw any of this and now it's, it's rampant. What, uh, what percentage of the people that you see as a functional doctor do you think have uh, extra mast cells going on? Oh, Bob, I think it's upwards of 50%. It's, it's almost always coexistent now with all the all things we talked about, the chronic infections, the toxicity, the mold, the Lyme, et cetera. Many, many people, I'd say half of them, have mast cell activation as part of the picture. Mm -hmm. And mast cells are our friends, unless mm -hmm. they're not. Yeah. If they're overactive, that's a problem. The CERT enzyme, CERT1, inhibits NF-kappa B, inhibits NOx. You can have genetic mutations on here, or unfortunately, high fructose corn syrup inhibits it. We can have mutations in the KIT gene that will make more mast cells. Then we make histamine. And we did a whole uh, recording on histamine and when that's in excess, we have enzymes called HNMT, MAOA, MAOB, the aldehydes. Uh, there's a UGT1A4. There's dynamine oxidase that clears histamine. And you can have issues here where you don't clear your histamine. Or lipopolysaccharides can stimulate HDC enzyme to make more histamine. Then here comes the infamous Carnahan reaction, okay, where the histamine stimulates an enzyme called INOS. Now, I really encourage everybody to watch the video we did on INOS. Uh, just go to your YouTube channel or any other place where you have them and just search for the INOS. We really do a deep dive as to what happens when this gets upregulated, downregulates the ENOS. You lose your BH4. Then rather than making nitric oxide, you make superoxide. Then you make peroxynitrite. This is called NOS uncoupling very common, you know, people who have Raynaud's or just circulatory issues have this. Then and, we and I was going to put it in perspective with uh, INOS, what we see is we love nitric oxide. Athletes try to make more by taking beet juice. It's really popular to enhance nitric oxide for blood flow, for vasodilation. However, 
too much is the Goldilocks principle, like always, right? Too little, too much is not a good thing. And for many people like myself with the INAS um, mutations, it's upregulated. So they produce too much. And how that could present clinically is syndromes like POT. So many of you have heard of postural orthostatic tachycardia, where you basically vasodilate, you drop your pressure to 85 over 45 or 50, and you have hypotension, you have dizziness, fatigue. And that's very commonly related to this INAS upregulation, especially is it INAS2, right? The one you just showed us. Yeah, it's INOS2. Or it's, um, yeah, it's NOS2 or INOS. Got it. Uh, so it's INOS or NOS2. Now, there is, um, you know, some of the recent researches indicating that it may not be the extra nitric oxide, but it's this running too fast, running out of BH4, and we're making mm -hmm. superoxide ah. rather than excess nitric oxide. So you'll see literature on both. But the current scientific thinking is that, well, yes, the INOS is running, but it may not be the nitric oxide. It okay. may be the superoxide. Either way, it's it's semantical which one it is. It's a problem and it's inflammatory. But I just wanted to point out there's there's debate as to which one it is. Perfect. But anytime INOS runs too fast, you're going to have a problem because you get NOS uncoupling. Then we activate our platelets. And as you know, uh, thick blood, varicose veins, clots, uh, and strokes is on the rise mm -hmm. uh, because these platelets get activated. Then it creates something called Rantes. And again, we're not going to cover that. Watch our platelet activation video for that. But then we need our good fats. We need our omega-3s used by the FADS enzymes to make what are called protectins and resolvins that can calm this down. We didn't talk about this in the previous uh, webinar. We didn't have this information, but NADPH is the cofactor for these. So if NOx is constantly being upregulated, we may not even be able to use our fats properly and using the omega-3s could actually be pro-inflammatory. Then to wrap it up, TNFA stimulates an enzyme called PLA2. And I have to admit, I'm uh, enamored by this because I believe this is really being upregulated where it pulls arachidonic acid out of the cell membrane. Now, arachidonic acid plays important roles in the body. It's not all bad, but when it's pulled out of the cell membrane, it can go down through multiple pathways to make inflammation. Um, the one we're just going to show here is there's an enzyme called 5-LOX that makes leukotrienes. And what's interesting, we're finding that there is one SNP that is a gain of function on 5-LOX, uh, and there's a CYP4A2, uh, I'm sorry, CYP4F2, that inhibits leukotrienes. And what we're finding is when people have this upregulated, this downregulated, they have inflammation that they just can't seem to get under control. And we'll show that when we look at your uh, at your map. Uh, then I'm not going to go into this, but just very briefly, it can stimulate interleukin-6, and it can stimulate angiotensin-2, uh, which is involved with uh, blood pressure, but also stimulates interleukin-6. And I'm just mentioning that because heme oxygenase can calm that down as well. So that is the problem that we identified. So when we talked about platelet activation, we we gave the problem, but I didn't realize at the time that heme oxygenase plays a very important role in calming all of this down. And I have that uh, in the next slide here. But before we do that, I just want to show when the heme is made, here's your heme oxygenase enzyme. And we need NADPH to turn that broken down heme into carbon monoxide. And yes, that is the one that kills us if we get too much of it. Helps your iron go into ferritin so it doesn't become a free radical. And then our emphasis today is going to be on the biliverdin and the bilirubin. Um, and again, we think of bilirubin being too high as a problem. Sure it is. But I think people are going to be stunned that bilirubin is right up there with glutathione as a... Uh, as an antioxidant. Now, we're going to get into the um, the iron here. We're just going to have a couple slides on iron, then a couple on carbon monoxide, but then really focus on the, uh, the bilirubin. So iron-derived reactive oxygen species are involved in the pathology of numerous vascular disorders, uh, and that is the, the iron in the heme, which is dangerous when it escapes from its, uh, from its physiologic site. Then the endothelial cells upregulate this enzyme, hemoxygenase and ferritin, 
And what they're saying is that it has been shown to be effective in the protection of the endothelium against the damaging effects of heme and oxidant. Heme and oxidants, lack of adaption in an iron-rich environment, led to extensive endothelial damage in humans. So what they're saying here, to, to sum it up, the heme oxygenase takes what could be a nasty free radical, that, that iron, and puts it into something safe. And here is a chart that shows it. Here's your heme oxygenase one and two. And we're saying it's degraded by heme oxygenase leading to the generation of this ferrous iron. However, the heme oxygenase activation also increases ferritin expression, which can bind to ferrous iron and detoxify its pro-oxidant effect. So here you can see as it goes into the ferritin, it can negate that pro-inflammatory. So you can see here, if you don't have heme oxygenase working, this iron can be very, very inflammatory. And I believe one of our early uh, recordings was on the, uh, the dangers of iron. And we talked about the, uh, the Fenton reaction. Yes. Where iron yeah. combines with uh, hydrogen peroxide. Yeah, and Bob, I always love to talk about to patients that give them a really clear, it's like if you have an old car and it starts getting rusty, the iron rust, and that becomes, that's basically what can happen in your body is this oxidative stress creates rusty iron. I'm, I'm exaggerating a little, but the idea is this oxidative stress in the body with iron combined with iron is really nasty. And so many docs and people are like, oh, everybody, every woman should be on iron supplements. Yes, there's a place for it. We need iron clearly, but if you have excess iron or if you're not binding iron or you have oxidative stress, iron can be very problematic too. It's not, it's a, it's a, there's a neutral place where it's very good for us, but there's a problematic place where it becomes very dangerous. Absolutely. And you know, as we've had these discussions over the years, we keep coming back to the same thing. Too little or too much of anything can be yeah. helpful or harmful. Uh, there's that Goldilocks, as you said, that, uh, that spot in the middle where everything is, uh, is balanced. And I want to just mention, this is just from memory, so I may be quoting myself a little wrong way back 20 years ago in med school, but with carbon monoxide, there's a big shift with, with the acid alkaline of the body, the pH. And so I'm suspecting one of the ways that it could be beneficial is enzymes are all regulated by pH in the blood. And there can be just the smallest 0.1 change of the pH. And there's shifts in enzymes opening up or closing or active or non-active. And I'm guessing in this situation, the benefits of a little carbon monoxide are actually changing the pH of the blood in a beneficial direction. Sounds like a plausible thought to me. Mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. So here it summarizes, takes care of the iron, makes a little bit of carbon monoxide, which is vasodil vasodilate, anti-inflammatory, antithrombotic, and then also makes the biliverdin that turns into the bilirubin that we're going to be talking about shortly. Now, clearly, carbon monoxide is a killer. Okay. Um, it kills, you know, many people every year. And uh, way back in the 19th century, uh, they figured out that it might be uh, overcoming the uh, the oxygen, so therefore, you know, we're asphyxiated. So clearly, I mean, this is a killer, no doubt. Uh, you know, no, no one would do it, but don't go exposing yourself to carbon monoxide thinking you're doing something good uh, because your body makes it in very small amounts. So please don't think that you're going to uh, help yourself by breathing carbon monoxide. So here it's talking about, it's a, uh, it's a gas, a second messenger produced when heme oxygenase catabolize heme. Now, what's interesting, here they're saying low concentration carbon monoxide has a neuroprotective agent for combination treatment of stroke. And its beneficial effect would be at least partially mediated by activation of the NERF2 pathway. So I've been pondering this a little bit and you can't find any literature that's definitive, mm -hmm. but I'm wondering if it's, its effect isn't that it just gives a little kick to NERF2. And I know we've spoken about this before, but if someone's new, it's worth repeating. NERF2 is what stimulates the production, utilization, and recycling of your antioxidants. It's, uh, it's also involved with all of your detox pathways. So there might be multiple, like you mentioned as well, but it may also stimulate uh, NERF2. That makes sense. And, day, and the other thing that's really interesting, Bob, is um, anything in excess oxygen can kill too, right? Because reactive oxygen, too much oxygen. So in my mind, this could also help modulate if there's too much reactive oxygen, especially neurologically, because that's such a problem with um, oxidative stress in the brain. 
Absolutely. So here we're saying carbon monoxide can quell inflammation, defend tissue from oxidative stress, prevent cell death and more. So in high levels, it causes cell death. At the low level, again, created by heme oxygenase, not anyone using it on their own, uh, can actually prevent cell death. And this is an interesting um, quote here. Um, it helps with the uh, lung transplants, lung fibrosis, ulcerative colitis, cancer, heart disease. And here's a, here's a quote from a lung disease expert at uh, Cornell Medical College. There is no molecule that's been shown, shown to be this cytoprotective in just about every organ tissue, the brain, the lung, the pancreas, the heart, the kidney, you name it. Um, when I was preparing for this, I was really surprised at, uh, at this because we all think of carbon monoxide as a killer. Uh, and I hear this article that was printed back in uh, 2011, carbon monoxide activated nerve two pathway leads to protection against uh, ischemia. So that's why I believe that there might be a component of this. And they're even actually saying the beneficial effect would be at least partially mediated by activation of the nerve two pathway. All right, carbon monoxide induces vasodilation and nitric oxide release. Now, interestingly, high levels inhibits nitric oxide synthase activity. Lower concentrations releases nitric oxide from a large intercellular pool and therefore may mimic the vascular effects of nitric oxide. So here again, it's, it's dosage, and I've probably said it too many times, but just again, it's what your body creates, not what you'd expose yourself to. Now, here's an interesting chart that shows that the carbon monoxide stimulates the antioxidant response element for your, uh, for your KEEP1 and NERF2, which then increases your antioxidants. And as we'll talk about later, NERF2 stimulates and controls heme oxygenase. So it's like we've got a, a, a loop here and uh, fascinating uh, how the body works. Now we wanna get into what bilirubin does. So you remember, we very quickly went through it. So we talked about the dangers of tumor necrosis factor alpha being too high. Again, we need it, but when it's excessive, this is when you get your autoimmune diseases. Your NF kappa B, we need it, but in excess can be very inflammatory. By the way, just as a clinical observation, Dr. Jill, mm -hmm. those who seem to be incredibly ill from Lyme disease, we're finding that they have a homozygous mutation on the one NF kappa B that's a gain of function. Mm. The NOx enzyme, again, creates the mast cells. And interleukin-6, I think um, the, the, the video we did on IL-6 is still your most viewed video. I do too, uh, yeah, people are really loving that one. Yeah, so all of these are pro-inflammatory. CERT1 holds it back. Look what Billy Rubin does. It inhibits TNFA. It inhibits NF-kappa B. The heme oxygenase enzyme supports CERT1. Billy Rubin uh, puts down nit nitric oxide, synth or the, uh, the NOx enzyme, NADPH oxidase, and it inhibits interleukin-6. And I don't have it on this chart because it's way down the chart, but it also inhibits INOS, Carnahan reaction, all from Billy Rubin. Wow. I mean, I was, uh, I was quite stunned when I started researching what it does. Uh, so here's the heme oxygenase enzymes. And then what we're gonna do today is we're gonna talk about how this is all controlled by a NERF2, which is controlled by a KEEP1. And then we're gonna talk about one of my favorite subjects, NADPH, mm -hmm. because we're gonna talk about how there's an enzyme called POR that donates the NADPH to heme oxygenase. Now let's think about this a little bit. If you've got the NOx enzyme chewing up your NADPH, you may not have enough over here. Mm -hmm. Then you can also have genetic mutations in G6PD and ME1. And by the way, this is one of the most worldwide common mutations there is. Mm -hmm. You may not be making enough NADPH for the enzyme to give there. NERF2 turns these guys on, KEEP1 shuts them down. There's a whole lot of things that can go wrong here. And clinical observation, those people who are really struggling with Lyme or molar mycotoxins, they usually have some issues with their heme oxygenase 
or the delivery of NADPH or the heme cycle that delivers the heme. Mm-hmm. So this really is the 3D chess game. And you could see people having low bilirubin or low heme oxygenase. You could probably have 30 to 50 different ways you got there. Yeah. So there isn't a one size fits all. There isn't a, oh, take this herb for that. It's complex. We like simple answers. And wouldn't it be nice if it was? But uh, there aren't when it comes to this. It's, it's rather complex. You know, Bob, I just want to comment. I was giving a lecture for a group this morning, and one of the comments was, is this substance good or bad? And I had to laugh because it depends, right? And that's the answer for most of the stuff is it really, the more we do personalized precision medicine, the more it really is important because you could have turmeric cause histamine in um, in someone or be the best antioxidant in another person. So there's never a one size fits all. And we have to kind of become uncomfortable with that uncertainty that there isn't just a protocolized approach. And the best treatment is this real individualized deep dive. Yes. When somebody, I tell my clients, if somebody says everyone should, Yes. If that doesn't include drinking water, anything else other than drinking water and breathing air, get wor- very worried. <laughs> Absolutely agree with you. Yes. yes. So here's a little more detail. The heme cycle helps make the heme. Now, that's what we talked about earlier. So succinyl COA, that comes from our Krebs cycle. Glycine comes from our diet. It's amino acid. And this is controversial. Uh, Stephanie Seneff talks about how glyphosate she believes interferes with glycine, you will see other sincere, you know, scientists say we don't think so. Stephanie said it talks about how so we can, uh, we can have glyphosate possibly about how glyphosate. I'm sorry, Bob, give me one sec, let me turn off the mute here. You will see other sincere, you know, scientists say we don't think so. Okay, there we go. The thing just popped on and gave our echo again. (laughs) Let's start, go, keep going. I'm sorry. Yes. So I don't know how much we lost there. So I'll just start over. Second or two. Yeah. Yeah. So succinyl COA, which comes from the Krebs cycle, and glycine uh, that comes from our diet, starts the process and goes through these eight steps to make uh, heme. And as I was saying that, uh, you know, that maybe got interrupted, glyphosate or Roundup, uh, some very sincere people say that it interferes. Some people say they don't think it does. Um, so it, it may or may not. I tend to think it does, but... You know, I want to hold open the thought that it may not be totally accurate. But nonetheless, it's not good for us. Mm -hmm. So if we don't have enough heme, we then don't have the ability to make the carbon monoxide, take take the iron, break it down. And I'm looking for literature, and I didn't find it yet. I was hoping to find it before this this, uh, podcast, but I couldn't find it. But it would make sense that if heme oxygenase isn't working quite well, this heme in the iron then just becomes very inflammatory, but I couldn't find any papers on it, but I'm, I'm sure it's there. Then as we talked about, ME1 and G6PD delivered to the POR enzyme, and we're going to talk about this one. We've never talked about POR before, but I'm really blown away by how important this is because it donates the heme ox- it donates the NADPH to the heme oxygenase. So we can have perfect heme oxygenase. We can have all the heme we want, Nerve 2 can be functioning, but if we don't have any DPH being delivered, it's like having a brand new car without any gas. Now, I am very enamored by riboflavin, and I think we've spoken about this before. Um, riboflavin is needed to make FAD, which is needed for the POR enzyme to work. And you can have genetic mutations on these transporters or the FLAD1 enzyme that makes the FAD. So there's a heck of a lot here that can go wrong, Dr. Jill. And uh, so I think it's important for the functional doctor to be able to see where the problem is. Because yes, there's herbs that stimulate heme oxygenase. But if you're not getting G6PD and ME1 to deliver the NADPH, it's not going to help. If you don't have this cycle working properly, you're not going to have the supply of heme and stimulating this isn't going to help. Really a uh, complex uh, situation. Yeah, and Bob, I just want to comment from seeing a lot of organic acid tests. We've talked about this before too. I know you're now incorporating that those results into your testing, but glutaric acid is a marker on organic test that, testing that shows riboflavin deficiency. And I will say it is probably one of the number, not one of, it is the number one deficiency I see on organic acids. And I think I just speak, you know, honestly, I think a lot of colleagues ignore that, oh, riboflavin is it that big a deal. And I find it is a big deal. 
um, especially in something like migraines um, it's and, and many other processes, that riboflavin is huge. And we, we tend to give the glory to like the methyl B12 and the methyl folate. I think riboflavin is just right up there with the importance. Oh, absolutely. I've been doing some, uh, some webinars for doctors on methylation, and I call it get your ducks in a row. And that is don't even think about giving methylfolate if you're low in riboflavin, because riboflavin is one of the cofactors for the uh, for the methyl group to go onto the folate. And you hear this all the time that uh, some well meaning person either on their own or through a practitioner says, Oh, I've got MTHFR, therefore I need to take methylfolate. And they feel phenomenal for 10 days and then it's like what just happened to me, <laughs> they get irritable they get inflamed. Uh, just as a side note, and maybe this could be a, a another show we do, but the, uh, the histamine and methyl transferase gets stimulated by methylfolate. If the downstream from that, the MAOA and the MAOB can't handle it, it actually makes the situation worse. Uh, so we have to be real careful with, uh, with methylfolate. I tend to think in the functional world, it's being given just a little too much. Now, obviously somebody's pregnant, we yeah. gotta have it. If you've got a high homocysteine that's related to this, maybe it's time to be done. But other than that, I think we're overdoing it just a bit. Bob, I agree. And I just want to comment and clarify what you just said with the hist so histamine intolerance, mass cell activation. A lot of these are poor breakdown of histamine, among other things. And methylation breaks down histamine. But like you just said, I just want to clarify, because if you're having a poor MAO or one of those other enzymes, you can actually be in a worse situation with histamine if you give too much methyl folate. And is that what you're basically saying? One yes, piece of exactly. Yeah, you got it. Yeah, absolutely right. So when people have mutations in MAOA and MAOB, or the cert one that controls it, uh, I tend to think if there's any chance that you're creating excess histamine, take care of that first before you support methylation. Um, so I've done some uh, some webinars on that effect, and I think I actually presented that for uh, for Great Plains one time. I call it getting your ducks in a row. Uh, and in addition to uh, to histamine, you also have to be careful with uh, dopamine. Yes. Because folate and SAMI can uh, can drive dopamine. Um, Anyway, as I said, uh, we need fat also for the PPOX enzyme. And there's other cofactors along here. And uh, we're investigating how maybe we can help practitioners making a custom supplement that may not only give the succinyl COA and the glycine, but where they have weakness, find where the cofactor help is needed. Uh, so that's, uh, that's one of the things we're, uh, we're researching. But as I said, lead will impact some of these. And uh, glycine deficiency just as a little side note uh again clinical observation when people have difficulty here unless they have a dairy problem they love ice cream because it provides the glycine and the carbohydrate and here we go and when people have trouble in here they often get what we call hangry where intermittent fasting on our ketogenic diet is a disaster, which goes back to what we just said. Intermittent fasting can be fabulous, but if this pathway isn't working, it uh, it bombs on you. Same with keto can be fabulous, but if you don't have these, these people need carbohydrates on a regular basis. So um, that was a little uh, side trail there, but uh, probably worth putting. Actually, in. really important, Bob, because again, right now, there's so much uh, emphasis on intermittent fasting for everyone, right? And keto diet for everyone. And I agree with you, there are many patients who do not tolerate that and actually do far worse. So you really have to know who you're dealing with in order to use those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just, just um, you know, clinical observation. I've When I've seen people that have a lot of issue here, I say, did you ever try keto or intermittent fasting and did it go poorly? And it's like, how did you know? Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So again, it goes back to everyone should um, is not a good thing to say. All right. Now let's get into the crux of the matter. What's uh, bilirubin? It's the result of the breakdown of red blood cells. Now there are conditions that you can have high bilirubin. This is a problem. Once in the liver, the bilirubin becomes conjugated. This means it's water soluble and the body can excrete it. And we're actually going to look at the um, glucuronidation enzymes that, um, that turn it into something that can be removed because unconjugated is toxic and it's usually not because it can come out of the body as long as nothing is interfering with its removal. All right, when it's too high, this is when the liver's not working properly 
and it can't make the bilirubin water soluble. Then it builds up in the liver. Causes can be hepatitis, alcoholic liver disease, some medicine overdoses, autoimmunity. All of those things can cause the bilirubin to go too high. We get yellow, yellowing of the whites of the eyes, dark colored urine, itchy skin, pale stool. We can have nausea, vomiting, stomach pain, bloating, weight loss, headaches, confusion, fatigue, drowsy, all from bilirubin too high. Now, this is probably the slide that's gonna blow everybody away. Everybody knows about glutathione and how wonderful it is. And everything you've heard is absolutely true. So in this study, which and some people might wanna just, you know, put these words in and read the whole paper. Water-soluble glutathione primarily protects water-soluble proteins, whereas the lipophilic bilirubin protects lipids from oxidation. Whoa. <laughs> When I saw that one, it's like, seriously? Um, and this was, uh, this was published all the way back in uh, 2009. So in my opinion, in the functional world, the functional doctors need to be aware of this and not always look to glutathione as being the, the savior every time. Um, I love that, Bob. So and I'm wondering about, because we're doing tests that show lipid peroxides, right? Which is oxidation of lipids. So with someone who shows those high lipid peroxides, this is something we need to really be thinking about. Absolutely. So in mice, they deleted the hemoxygenase enzyme, which generates the biliverdin, and they displayed greater lipid than protein oxidation, while the reverse holds true for the glutathione depletion. So um, this is something that I believe the functional world needs to start uh, looking at. I was quite surprised. Now, there's, um, there's even more. Bilirubin scavenges superoxide, one nasty free radical. It inhibits one of my favorite subjects, NADPH oxidase. Very quickly, NOx or NADPH oxidase is our friend because when we have a virus or bacteria or a pathogen, it kicks in and says, we've got an enemy here. We've got to fight and kill. Without that, we die. But I believe there's many environmental or genetic factors overstimulating the NOx enzyme. And here we have it that Billy Rubin will calm that down. So what they're saying is expression of inducible form of heme oxygenase, this is the one that kicks in when it's challenged, can be boosted by oxidative stress, sometimes from the NADPH oxidase activity, and then it puts the protection in. It starts creating the, the Billy Rubin that feeds back to quell this oxidative stress. So if something is stimulating uh, the NOx enzyme and we don't have the Billy Rubin, that's when things can get carried away. And I keep going back to, I believe a major thing we're seeing today is upregulation of the NADPH oxidase enzyme. It's our army. It's what kills the pathogens, but it hurts us if it's running too fast. And I believe we did a, 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 a Facebook Live just on that subject of um, all the things that upregulate the NOx enzyme. Yes, we did. And there's a lot. There's a list. And again, this is our environment. We're all swimming in toxic soup. So part of what we're seeing is we are all getting exposed more and more and more to higher levels. And then what can our bodies handle? And those who have genetic mutations are starting to get ill. Absolutely. As we've said many times, genetics loads the gun, but the environment pulls the trigger. So here's an article. Uh, it says Billy Rubin inhibits the activation process of the NADPH oxidase. We said the same thing, but another article just uh, reinforcing that concept. Now, this really surprised me. It's a potent antioxidant that can protect the cells from a 10,000 fold increase of excess hydrogen peroxide. And hydrogen peroxide, again, can be used to kill pathogens, but too high creates a problem for us. So it says bilirubin acts as an antioxidant, then it's oxidized to biliverdin and then recycled by biliverdin reductase back to bilirubin. And we'll show that on the charts when we look at your, uh, your DNA. There's more. Inhibited the secretion of tumor necrosis factor and interleukin-6, indicating the inhibition of the NF-kappa B pathway. I mean, it just keeps going on what, uh, what this does. It could therefore be considered an endogenous regulatory molecule modulating inflammation. Um, now, this is fascinating. Uh, this was um, 
let's see, I don't see a published date. Um, oh yeah, September of 2009. Moderate high bilirubin is associated with reduced incidence of cardiovascular disease, including hypertension. Now, we talked about this more when we talked about the, uh, the home cycle, so we don't have time to get into it today, but the angiotensin II is what can create uh, uh, the body to hold on to sodium and excrete potassium. Moderately high bilirubin prevents that angiotensin II dependent hypertension. So um, there we go. And of course, we're seeing so much uh, high blood pressure. And, you know, we see the, um, you know, the sodium retention with the, uh, with the edema that goes with it. Uh, Billy Rubin exerts uh, reno, reno is a kidney, in the angiotensin hypertension. As we know, the hypertension can affect uh, the kidneys. And we're saying they conclude <clears throat> that the bilirubin exerts reno protective effects on the angiotensin II dependent hypertension. Uh, unconjugated bilirubin modulates nitric oxide production via INOS regulation. As we said earlier, this is the Carnahan reaction. And we're going to show once again where you inherited from both mother and father mutations on the two INOS that makes it overactive. And they're saying here that created a significant reduction of INOS gene expression. So there you go, Dr. Jill. We now have a way to um, help reduce the effect of the Carnahan reaction on you. Unbelievable. This is amazing. Um, now, we're, we spoke about uh, CERT-1, um, and I don't think I put a chart in this time, but CERT-1 um, also helps you make superoxide dismutase and enos, as well as knock down inflammation. And it's saying that hemoxygenase has the ability to restore cellular redox and rescue CERT-1. So you can see there's a relationship between CERT-1 and hemoxygenase. They help each other out in a feedback loop. Um, now, this uh, is something we're just beginning to research, and uh, we don't have a lot of data on this. Data on this, But when bilirubin is released into the plasma, it is taken up by albumin, which serves as its transporter throughout the body. Uh, the binding is extremely high, and uh, under ideal conditions, unconjugated bilirubin is seen in the plasma. Um, I was hoping to get a little more research on this done before the uh, our broadcast here, but I didn't. But this is an interesting study, and this published in February of 2020. The role of the bilirubin to albumin ratio as a predictor for mortality in critically ill patients without other problems. So they were saying that high bilirubin and low albumin are frequently appeared and associated with poor prognosis in critically ill patients. Their conclusion was, a higher bilirubin to albumin ratio is related to the unfavorable prognosis and mortality in critically ill patients. Mm. Well, maybe sometime we can come back when we have more information on this to learn, you know, how the uh, albumin carries it around. I'll be honest, I don't have a strong understanding of this yet, uh, but uh, we need the albumin. So if the albumin goes down, then we don't get the, the positive effects of the, uh, of the bilirubin. Um, as we know, Gilbert syndrome is a condition where people have a, occasional and short-lived episodes of yellowing of the skin and whites of the eyes caused by a buildup of bilirubin in the blood. And we'll show this in the software. There's an enzyme called UGT1A1, which is part of a process called glucuronidation, uh, where it takes the unconjugated bilirubin, conjugates it, and then excretes it. So if we have genetic issues here, we may not be able to... Uh, excreted properly, and then the bilirubin becomes a problem. Uh, interestingly, homocysteine downregulates the hemoxygenase 1 enzyme. And, um, you know, I, we, we could do a whole show on homocysteine. There's books out there that says high homocysteine virtually causes uh, so many things that will cause you to live longer uh, or less long yeah. uh, because it does so much uh, damage. And I knew some of the damage that homocysteine did I was not aware that it downregulated hemoxygenase. So measuring that uh, homocysteine is uh, so important. I'm sure as a functional doctor, you do that all the time. You probably look at people's homocysteine. I do routinely and totally agree with you. I've seen someone in people's in the 20s and it's very concerning. 
Absolutely. And the catch-22 is, you know, sometimes it's folate and B12, but then that can backfire in other ways. So it really becomes a, a, a tightrope as to how you uh, bring that down safely. What uh, percentage of your patients do you think have high homocysteine that you see? Um, this is definitely less than mast cells. I'd say maybe 15, 20%. It's still a, like maybe one in five, but yeah. not as high. Yeah. And unfortunately it's not measured very often. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, often when I do, you know, consults with folks in our health coaching, we say, have you ever measured your homocysteine? They never heard of it. No one's ever measured it. Yes. And, uh, it can be very, very important. And just if you're listening out there, I like to see below nine, but in the Bredesen protocol with uh, dementia and those kinds of things, we're going below seven even. So, um, but then on the other hand, below four is an issue too. So there's a happy medium as well. Mm, yeah, absolutely. Because we need homocysteine to go down through transulfuration to make our glutathione. Mm -hmm. So again, I, everything, every time we do a show here, we talk about not too little, not too much. Mm -hmm. um, so I now want to focus on the POR enzyme. I'm very intrigued by this guy because it donates NADPH to heme oxygenase one, but not only heme oxygenase one, most of your cytochrome, poor, cytochrome P450s use POR to donate the NADPH. So you can have genetic mutations and I'll show you those when we look at your genome. You can have mutations in G6PD, ME1. We mentioned this earlier, you need FAD to be the cofactor, not enough riboflavin causes that. Um, then you can have mutations in G6PD or ME1, or they can be just fine. But if you've got NERF2 issues or KEEP1 issues, they don't get stimulated. They don't do their job. Um, let's go back to uh, to riboflavin. What is your what is your favorite dosing for for riboflavin? Um, well, you know, it's funny because a lot of times some like riboflavin biphosphate is the active form and it comes in like thirties, which is I think way too little. I usually start at a hundred and with migraines, I'll go up to 400 per day. Hmm. Okay. All right. I was curious what your, uh, what your dosing was there. Now people probably have never heard of the POR gene. And I think we need to look at this gut because it provides instructions for making the en enzyme cytochrome P450 oxyreductase. 50 enzymes depend upon this, and they're involved with the synthesis and breakdown of various molecules and chemicals within cells. So if we don't have those uh, CYPs working, these are folks that have all the negative effects with, uh, with medications or they're exposed to any chemicals and they can't handle it. Um, as we said, it's involved with the metabolism of ingested substances such as medications in the liver. Now, this is gonna surprise you. It's involved in your drug metabolism, your steroid metabolism, your xenobiotics, and your heme oxygenase. Mm -hmm. So if this guy doesn't have a source of NADPH, or uh, it's got mutations that it doesn't have the, the, uh, the FAD, it's not going to do this job. Now we're not gonna spend a lot of time on this one, but look at, uh, look at this guy. This is a chart of how POR is involved in all of your hormones. Here's your cholesterol, your pregnenolone, your progesterone, your testosterone. Every time you see this little orange here, POR is involved. Mm. So you're gonna have hormonal disruption. And then here it talks about bone formation, the steroid metabolism we just talked about, drug metabolism, detoxification, your hemoglobin metabolism, and your uh, cholesterol, all controlled by POR. And I just want to illustrate again the importance of NADPH because NADPH helps recycle your thyroidoxin, your glutathione, your catalase, helps DHFR deliver folate, helps the POR, but here's NOx, NADPH oxidase. NOx will use it to make free radicals. And if this guy is upregulated, likely all of these others are going to suffer. And that's why I keep going back to, we got to be looking at the NOx enzyme. Mm -hmm. So again, I talked about this a little bit, but just a, uh, a quick review. The succinyl COA comes from the Krebs cycle. Dietary efficiencies or possibly glyphosate may impede it. Mutations in any of the heme cycle enzymes may lower it. Lead may lower it. And then the porphyrins go from one to another through the cycle. Then they may block the GABA receptor sites. 
is where people get hangry, where mm -hmm. it's like, I'm upset, I'm frustrated, I got to have some food. They feel better after they eat. Now, action steps. And again, I'd encourage people to watch our uh, episode 102. Remove exposure to mold in your environment. Can't emphasize that enough. And I'm sure you talk to people about mold and they'll tell you, oh, I don't have any mold in my house. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and the, because they don't see anything black growing on the walls. That doesn't mean uh, you don't have mold. It can hide in many places. And I know you've uh, you've done other webinars on uh, on mold. I'd encourage people to, to watch them, but take it seriously. Uh, make sure you don't have any virus or clostridia or any source of lipopolysaccharides. Here's a couple of nutrients that can support TNFA, black cumin, milk thistle, EGCG, and uh, Boswellia. All of those can help with TNFA. Um, NF-kappa B, remove exposure to mercury, treat virus. Uh, consider reducing exposure to glyphosate, uh, reduce TNFA over stimulation. Uh, we're just uh, beginning to dig into this because um, we may make a supplement for NF-kappa B, but the vitamin E gamma version, curcumin, fish oils, alpha lipoic acid, NAC, but you gotta be careful, reishi mushroom, green tea, and resveratrol, calm down NF-kappa B. In other words, what we're doing here is we're saying, let's not stress heme oxygenase as much. Um, NADPH oxidase, take care of the histamine, the oxalates, glutamate, Get away from air pollution. I remember you saying when you had the uh, the big fire in your town that uh, it really impacted people. Yeah, we uh, saw TNF alpha and uh, TGF beta and all kinds of things rise just from the smoke exposure because it was so toxic. Mm -hmm. uh, keep homocysteine at a healthy level. Keep dopamine at a healthy level. Keep sulfites at a healthy level. Keep aldosterone at a healthy level. IL six, mTOR and autophagy. Um, there's a lot there, uh, but all of those have to be. Uh, taken care of. Curcumin, spirulina, and then any lifestyle or nutrients would support healthy levels of the stimulators uh, listed above. Interleukin-6. Again, the, um, that when I copied this, there was uh, 3,300 people who viewed that, and that's where we spoke about uh, interleukin-6. And probably the interest comes from, that's the cytokine storm mm -hmm. that everybody was trying to, to look at. Mold. Lyme disease, the lipopolysaccharides, EMF, radon and air pollution, particulates, lead, mercury, aluminum, glyphosate, the omega-6s, particularly canola oil, VOCs, pesticides, and any mTOR stimulator. Those will all stimulate IL-6. So what we've talked about here is how do we take the pressure off of heme oxygenase? Okay. Um, then uh, I'm not going to read these. If somebody's watching, they can just pause it and and write these down. But all of these things will again stimulate uh, interleukin-6, and then you can have genetic gain of function on interleukin-6. And here's some of the things that can reduce it. Hydrogen water, thiamine and riboflavin, black cumin, apigenin, pine bar, PEMF, I'm going to have a slide just on that. I know that's one of your favorite subjects, Dr. Jill. Yeah. Vitamin D, EPA and DHA. Hyperbaric, selenium, because it supports glutathione. Make sure your blood sugars are controlled, healthy weight, and moderate exercise. Then how do you support CERT? So CERT supports endothelial nitric oxide, the good blood flow, supports a major antioxidant, knocks down those two inflammatory enzymes. So reduce or eliminate high fructose corn syrup. We're going to look back on this someday and say, what were we doing? Yeah. yeah. CERT-1 is part of our anti-aging. High fructose corn syrup inhibits it. Um, intermittent fasting, again, if you don't have problems with the, uh, the heme cycle. Support heme oxygenase because that supports it. This is dependent upon NAD and reduce the overstimulation of it, resveratrol and terostilbe. And... So Bob, I was going to say, this is where people are talking a lot about autophagy. Autophagy is basically cell program death. So it prevents those cells that go rogue from becoming cancer. And it's very, very important for anti-aging because the senilence of the cells, as they become older, if they're not dying off, that's the most um, 
common thing that causes aging. So everything you're describing here, I just want to put it in practical application, is basically anti-aging and prevention of cancer. Um, two other drugs that I don't recommend, but um, do have also CERT1 activity and autophagy is uh, rapamycin and metformin. So those are the popular in the some of the, now they have side effects too. So again, you wouldn't want to use those without a physician um, helping, but this is all about um, anti-aging and prevention of cancer in the end. Absolutely. Well, here you can see CERT1 inhibits mTOR, yeah. which inhibits autophagy. So that's why CERT1 is one of my other one of my favorites. And when people have homozygous on CERT1, mm -hmm. they're usually struggling. You know, they've gone to 20 clinics and nobody can figure out what's happening. Makes sense. All right. How do we support uh, heme oxygenase? Support KEEP1 and NERF2, particularly uh, when I see a homozygous mutation on the KEEP1 overactive, these folks are in trouble. Here's your sulforapane, milk thistle, turmeric, resveratrol. Again, support adequate NADPH by not having an overactive NOx. We call that the NADPH steel. Spirulina calms that down a little bit. Again, adequate NAD, but after you've calmed down NOx. And then hops, Panax ginseng, sage, rosemary, turmeric, and broccoli, and probably others, support the enzyme. But again, I go back to if you think you're going to take care of it all just by doing this, as we as you learn, there's so many other pieces to this puzzle that you have to uh, take care of. All right, I thought you would uh, enjoy this, Dr. Jill. The um, pulsed electromagnetic field um, increases heme oxygenase one and superoxide dismutase. Yeah. Wow. And I believe uh, you have something on your website that um, the, the, the PMF that you recommend. Yeah, I love I love the higher dose. It's actually if you look right down there on the floor, <laughs> we kind of down there. I use it every single day. And I'll tell you something else, Bob, that's related to the whole stuff we talked about: platelet activation, Rantes. My theory, and I have evidence to back it up, is it actually helps with viscosity of blood. So people who are struggling after COVID or after Lyme or this with blood viscosity, I think it actually helps circulation. And I almost wonder if sometimes that's the most important thing that we feel because our blood is flowing better because that it, it's like a magnet that actually helps the blood flow circulation. Sure. Well, if you go back to that, that video, we talked about it's the upregulation of the INOS that activates the platelets. So if upstream, mm -hmm. you're able to slow that whole pathway down, um, that would make sense that it's going to improve the circulation. Yeah. We've also talked about molecular hydrogen. Okay. Um, so what they're saying is that hydrogen-rich water reduces reactive oxygen species production by inhibiting the NADPH oxidase activity. So that then, of course, is going to, uh, you know, take some strain off of your, uh, your heme oxygenase. In case anybody doesn't know, uh, you can get machines that'll knock the hydrogen loose from your water, uh, or you can uh, get some capsules. Oh, That's what got... we have here, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're, this is a hydrogen machine. I thought I, better, I have it right next to my desk here, because you and I, I know we love to use this. Absolutely. You can keep explaining, but I want to show they are expensive, um, but they are for me and probably for you too. I think they're so worth it because it neutralizes these reactive oxygen into water. So it's very, very safe. Absolutely. <laughs> so you can breathe the, um, the, uh, the hydrogen, or there's actually little tablets that you can drop into water that'll at least knock it loose uh, from the water. And um, it inhibits the NADPH oxidase activity, plus a lot more. Uh, so here we have molecular hydrogen against sepsis it upregulate upregulates sod heme oxygenase one catalase and suppresses nadph oxidase activity so i've been asked already it said bob if you could do one thing if there was something that said bob you get a choice you do one thing from a functional standpoint what would it be i think i'd pick hydrogen Bob, I agree. I want to just pause there because I just had this vision. Like, what if in ICUs and in hospitals, like every bedside had the breathing? Like, what, think of how much it, you just talk about sepsis and prevention. I wonder how much really severe illness we could prevent if we got these ill people breathing hydrogen or taking the tabs, but the breathing, it is even more powerful. Wouldn't that be amazing? <laughs> sure. Yeah. I mean, look at all it does. It yeah. neutralizes peroxynitrite, the ONO. Oh Here's your hydroxyl radical slows down INOS, slows down NADPH oxidase, increases SOD, heme oxygenase, and catalase, all from number one on the periodic table of elements, 
Mm -hmm. hydrogen. Yeah. So simple. <laughs> so simple. And maybe that's why we're not talking about it much. Yeah. Um, a little bit of exercise will increase the uh, hemo oxygenase as well. Okay, now we come to hey. looking at you. <laughs> <laughs> are you ready for this? My I'm friend? ready. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here you are. And this comes from the functional genomic analysis uh, software. And uh, this is um, the whole, what we, we call the, the Rantes map. So each of these circles is an enzyme. And uh, what we can do is we can click on any one of these and it'll actually show us what's happening. So you can see here, Dr. Joe, your tumor necrosis factor. See it pop up on the side here. Uh -huh. You're fine. But we talked about this before in the Carnahan reaction. You do have one mutation on the HFE, which causes you to absorb a little bit more iron. We didn't talk about this before because we didn't have it. But you do have gain of function on one of the NF kappa Bs. And just for those watching, if you've known, if your doctor maybe tested you for hemochromatosis, that HFE is one of the main genes for that. If you have two copies, you have hemochromatosis. But as we're talking here, carrier one copy does make a difference, even if you don't have full-blown hemochromatosis. Absolutely. It can cause you to absorb a little more iron. Incredibly common in people of uh, English yes. and Irish descent. So then we continue down the pathway and we need CERT1 to hold it back and you're fortunate, you do not have the CERT one. What we're finding, the people that are just really struggling might have TNFA, HFE, weakness in CERT one, exposed to mycotoxins and Lyme disease. These are the people that are just struggling so badly. Then we stimulate the NOx enzymes. Then there's an enzyme called KIT that will cause the mast cells to be a little overactive. And I don't know if we spoke about this, but you've got one little heterozygous on a kit gene that could cause your mast cells to be a little overactive. Then we make histamine. And again, watch our video on histamine. Mm -hmm. And here's the histamine and methyl transferase enzyme. And I don't have it on here, but that's what we spoke about. If you've got histamine and you take folate B12 or SAMI, you'll make more N-methyl histamine. And then if your MAOA and MAOB can't handle it, this is worse than the original histamine. Yeah, and in my experience, Bob, in the early days, right after my breast cancer, I realized I had methylation issues, MTHFR, one G mutation, and I took a lot of methylfolate and it did not go well, as you can imagine. Now, later on, as I've detoxified and done other things with the genes, I can definitely tolerate a milligram or two. But in the early days, it was disastrous, just like you said. Yes. And then histidine decarboxylase, this actually causes the body to take the amino acid histidine and make histamine. Uh, you do not have any of the evidence-based ones. In other words, these are the ones where there's literature that says this really impacts it. However, when we look at the ones that there's no evidence for, there's still a few, but we don't know what they do. But they, they could be a uh, gain of function, but we don't. We don't know for sure. Then here we go, the, um, the Carnahan reaction. Yes. The NOS2 is what makes a lot of nitric oxide to kill pathogens. And you've got an upregulation See, this lets some of you a little hard to see, but there's an up arrow here. Mother and father gave you mutation. Up arrow here, mother and father gave you mutation. And then that will stimulate um, the NOS uncoupling, which makes the superoxide, then makes our oh no peroxynitrite, which then further depletes uh, the BH4. And it's worth noting that BH4 is needed to make your serotonin and is involved with your uh, your dopamine as well. So many times people are depressed because they don't have enough pH4. All right, then we come over here and we uh, activate the platelets. Oops, what did I just do there? Mm -hmm. uh, we uh, we activate the uh, the platelets, and then we need our our good fats to. Uh, let me just make that a little bit bigger. We need our good fats made by the uh, the fads enzymes. And you're not too bad here. You just have a, a little bit on FADS2, nothing on FADS1, and uh, one on ELOVL2, which is the EPA to mm -hmm. DHA. Okay. Now, and I was mentioned there, Bob, because you mentioned this, I think it's important for people listening, that protections and resolvents, you basically bypass that pathway if you have issues. And those are the SPMs 
SPM active, SPM supreme. There's a lot of them out there. I found that to be incredibly helpful for me with inflammation. And it makes sense because I'm bypassing all of those FAD enzymes and the riboflavin for me for 20 years. I now I know why, but I've always taken at least hundred or 200 a day of riboflavin for years because I really do better with the riboflavin, which makes sense with the FAD enzyme. Absolutely. Now, this could be a, a, a future show to talk about this because I'm really becoming enamored by arachidonic acid. Mm -hmm. The tumor necrosis factor through PLA2 brings out the arachidonic acid. And uh, there's a couple of pathways, um, and I don't have that, uh, that chart ready, but one of them is to take the ALOX enzyme and make leukotriene B4, which is a nasty, nasty leukotriene. And you don't have any mutations here, but some people have gain of function. Mm -hmm. And the CYP, this one right here, calms down leukotrienes. Clinical observation. When somebody has homozygous here and homozygous here, they've got inflammation that they just can't seem to figure out why. So we're researching that. So you're fortunate uh, that you're clean as a whistle there. All right. Now, drum roll, we're going to look at your heme oxygenase. Mm -hmm. So here you can see your uh, your HO1 and your HO2 make the bilirubin and bilirubin. And you can see that uh, you've got a homozygous and two heterozygous on your HMOX1. Then you've got homozygous on HMOX2. Now you uh, are incredibly lucky because you do not have the gain of function on KEEP1. It's the folks who have this one, either mm -hmm. one or two, particularly the twos, that they, uh, they're, these are the people that sometimes are even bedridden from mycotoxin exposure. And you're very fortunate. I don't see this very often. You're perfect on all your nerve twos. So you don't see this often. Perfect on keep one, perfect on nerve two. So, but you do have weakness on HMOX one and HMOX two. Now talking about riboflavin, here are the um, riboflavin transporters, and you can see perfect, perfect, and FLAD1, which is making your, uh, your POR perfect. Um, so you really lucked out here. Uh, your POR enzyme, perfect. G6PD, not a thing. Not one little thing. ME1, perfect. And as I said, the NERF2 and KEEP1. So you really, uh, when, when I look at these, very seldom is this area this good. So uh, you're, you're very fortunate there because it could have been worse had you had issues here. Yeah. Now let's look at your, uh, your heme cycle. You do have a couple of pond ones which clears your, your glyphosate. Have you ever tested for glyphosate? Oh, yes, Bob. This is back. And again, I grew up on a farm, organophosphates, glyphosates, massive exposures, I think contributed to some of my history of illness. And when I first tested, when they very first came out with testing, I was three times the normal limits of farmers on application day. So, and that was with actually an organic diet, a pretty clean lifestyle. So this is absolutely very valid for me as far as exposure and accumulation of glyphosate. Yes. Have you tested recently? I'm better. I'm I'm low now. Finally, <laughs> with all the detox I've been. Good, yeah. good, good. Um, so with these PON one, which which by the way that stands for peroxinase that clears the pesticides. You know you've got to be very careful. Um, you know one of the things that uh, I, I'm sure maybe it's not so much anymore. Sometimes people go golfing and some people will smoke a cigar, and they'll put the cigar on the grass. You know it's like not a good idea. Yeah. So, you know, Bob, we were talking with Dale Bredesen about writing golf course Alzheimer's because there's so much related to the exposure on golf courses and pesticides in the brain. And so it's a very real phenomenon. I always ask people, where do you live? Do you live near a golf course? Because they're likely going to be exposed to a lot more pesticides. Absolutely. Now, your ALAD enzyme, you can see here you've got two heterozygous mutations. Then on the URAS, uh, you've got one. And on the CPOX, this is a new one that we've just added. I mean, literally in the last couple of weeks. And this is a rather uh, significant downregulation of the CPOX enzyme. So we could make an argument. There's, again, the key word is potential yeah. that you may not be doing this as strongly as you should. Then you get over to the HEMOX and it's, you know, not doing its best. 
Uh, but again, you're very fortunate, extremely fortunate. Mm -hmm. Key one, Nerf two, POR, G six PD. Um, so what's interesting is the, um, you know, you really got hit hard on the INOS, but you did. I, I would say that uh, probably one out of a thousand, if not less, wow. okay. that has everything perfect right here. Yeah. Um, so you're very very fortunate there. Um, and uh, that is um, that is you for this section. And um, as I said, you might have a little extra because of the HFE and the NF Kappa B, this could be pushed a little bit. Fortunately, your cert's good. But uh, for you, supporting this heme oxygenase might be to your uh, to your advantage. And I believe you you did uh, start a couple of things that uh, support, didn't you? Some sage or something? Or I did. I'm trying to think of what we talked about uh, because first the Inos was uh, lysine and uh, resveratrol. I added back in. I did SPMs, and I'm thinking recently with hemox, um, uh, B5 was that one of the cofactors? Uh, pyridoxine, or am I thinking about adrenals? Maybe. I think um, you're thinking about adrenals. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, there you uh, there you go. Um, we can now see why uh, you had some of the struggles that uh, that you had. And I'll just say one little thing about that because we've been talking on every. Um, it's kind of this pathway as we keep learning new things, and you share all your amazing knowledge. And I think I've shared on other with the INOS um, uh, video that we did about how I was struggling with low blood pressures and all of this. And I just told you before we started, but I want to say this for people who are thinking, oh, there's no mold in my house. I'm kind of the mold queen. I'll just say it. I, I love mold. I deal with mold. I, I really like, like help so many patients with mold. And it's one of my favorite things to do. And just recently, Bob, I told you that two or three weeks ago, I found ketomium, which is one of the nasty, the nasties behind my fridge, because there was a small leak in my home. And now I am feeling so much better. And I'm only just saying this because here I am. I know mold. I know how to prevent mold. I do all the right things. And even me in my home, I found mold recently. And there's no doubt all the stuff we've been talking about the last six months with the low blood pressure and the fatigue and some of the symptoms I was having related to that INOS pathway were related to the mold in my kitchen. So if you think there's no mold in your house, check again, because often there's these hidden things, even for the best of us who know what to do, um, that are causing illness. Absolutely. Well, I'm so glad you found it. And, uh, I'm sure it was a relief to you, for you to know yes. that there was a cause behind this. <laughs> right. Yeah. All right. Just a little commercial. If you are a health professional, uh, this is not for the general public. Uh, the software, the maps we looked at were made by the uh, the software, your functional genomics. And if you'd like to uh, to check us out, uh, just go to functionalgenomicanalysis.com. We have a online certification and you can save $100 by using the code Dr. Jill. The first couple modules are free. Then there's a charge and you can save $100 by using the code Dr. Jill. If somebody wants to talk to us here at the office for our health coaching, tolhealth.com, 717-733-2003. Again, the software, functional genomic analysis, and uh, Yvonne Lucchese or Chrissy can uh, can help health professionals. So um, so there we go. That's um, That's a really quick why we need to be aware of heme oxygenase. So to wrap it up, what we need to do is take away the environmental factors that would stress it, not have the enzymes that also stress it upregulated, and then find out if the heme oxygenase enzyme needs help, if the heme pathway needs help, or we need uh, NADPH through the POR enzyme. Bob, thank you. As always, this is just, I love going deep and I know so many of our listeners do. I think this is going to get thousands of more viewers. I'm going to share it everywhere that I can. I just want to thank you for your work. I always love promoting and helping you get more practitioners trained because truly I feel like this personalized approach is the thing that's the game changer for my most complicated patients. And I know you've seen that as well. So I just want to thank you publicly again for all of your hard work, all of your brilliance and helping us find the pathways. Even my, my own health has benefited from you. And I want to say that publicly because we're just all grateful with all the work that you do and that you continue to educate. And I really believe this is the future. Um, you know, I've said before with, I have a a book coming out next year in a documentary. And I would say, I want to teach the teachers and influence the influencers, because the more we can impact those who are out on the front lines, like the functionalists and doctors, and you're one of those people, you're one of those people who, who teaches the teachers and influences the influencers in a very positive way that's changing health and the world. So truly, thank you for your work. I'm so grateful. 
Well, my pleasure. And I do have to give also credit. Uh, I'm very fortunate. Uh, my son is following in my footsteps. Oh. And he now he says he's a uh, master's in pharmacogenomics. Yeah. So a lot of these things that I pointed out today, he's the one who uh, pointed them out. He pointed out the POR found the gain of function in the uh, in the five locks. So uh, so we're uh, we're having fun geeking out together and uh, working on it. So that is even more beautiful. That's the science generation. So as always, thank you. Thank you all for listening. Uh, leave some feedback, share with your friends, and we'll see you next time. Okay, a pleasure to be here.